pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just came out of closed session with nothing to report. Capital One Commercial, who are they and what are these expenses? That's Costco. Costco? Yeah. I see. Excuse me, Mr. Shea, I'm sorry I didn't hear or didn't realize that you skipped by the draft minutes. I heard you say draft minutes, but... I, we included them all together. Okay, will you give me I'll an give opportunity to speak yeah, for Absolutely. Them? Okay, thank you. Yes. 1699. County of Marine Central Collection, 5,115 5, legal fees. Yes. Okay. What is it? Um, a lot of them were like, primarily uh, dealing with issues in open space. Open space issues. Okay. Tuesday, November 14, um, and it's the very first, well, it's not the agenda, it's a consent calendar. Perry said she would like the minutes to reflect the fact the letter received from Bob Breyer is libel. I would like the record to show that this is not a fact, and also that this was Perry's opinion and not the opinion of the entire board. At least not as spoken at the meeting. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Cool. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. I mean, just in general, uh, yeah, the meeting notes. Whenever I mention something, it always sounds like a complaint rather than a specific item that I'm criticizing. Um, you know, just, it's not for all of them, but I one popped out of me. Um, Nestle County noticed the financial report in the package, but there's no good report on revenues. Specifically, I said that um, the revenues need to be itemized by uh, profit center. Um, so there can be a thorough understanding of the performance of revenue generating 
uh, activities. Um, <clears throat> the way that this is described, it just sounds like a pitch without any, any uh, point being made. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, it appears that I can call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Public comment, open time for items not on the agenda. Yes. And I would like to read this so that I'll go fast and not go over the limit. Um, first, I want to apologize to the firefighters, our chief, and all our volunteers at the fire department. You all deserve better and more respect from the district manager and board of directors. I'm very sorry we have been without a usable kitchen for nine and a half months now. There were several reasonable offers for the kitchen remodel, each shot down. Now we have the third contractor um, walking away because the district manager and four out of the five directors have said no again. So the sealed bidding starts <coughs> over after changing plans and request for proposal or bid, as you're now calling it. I'm thankful that our firefighters have not quit Marinwood due to the unsafe and unhealthy conditions of the non-kitchen kitchen. Number two, I'm sorry the paramedic talks have been going on for years without a solution. Uh, Marinwood deserves to have a working paramedics group and cannot because of an, un, uh, an impasse in negotiations. Mr. Naylor blames the firefighters for this, but he fails to understand that bargaining is a two-way street. Number three, I'm sorry the fire department has requested a utility pickup truck and that Mr. Naylor said in the 1114 board meeting, it's an irrational need. Uh, November 25th, there was a medical emergency, cardiac arrest on a fire road. Help was delayed to the victim because Marinwood did not have a safe four-wheel drive pickup truck to get to the victim. Number four, I'm sorry the fire, fire, fire department had to file a lawsuit to get the district to calculate their overtime correctly. Other fire departments in Marin and California had the same issues with overtime calculations, but settled much more quickly. It has been almost one year the district lost the lawsuit and must pay little over 10 grand, which covers three years of lost overtime for 16 firefighters. The district also must pay attorney's fees of 45,000 for the fire department and about 50,000 for the district, give or take. I don't know what those numbers are. What a waste of approximately $95,000 in attorney's fees. I'm also very sorry the fire department has been working without a real MOU contract for two and a half years. There is an interim mini contract, but it's not the real MOU. When will all this bias against the Marinwood Fire Department end? Thank you. Thank you. Steven? Yeah. Um, so my, uh, my points are uh, briefer than Linda's, uh, but they are about uh, attorney's fees. Uh, Notice we're having settlement on this. Uh, we spent thirty-five thousand dollars goes to the lawyers, and I guess thirty thousand dollars for our lawyers. So it's sixty thousand, I think, and then ten thousand and change for the firefighters themselves. I may have the numbers wrong, but the point is, is that we're spending a lot on attorneys' fees. There are three issues before the board legal issues and I mean I am still stunned that uh, the Millers who in my view have a legitimate uh, claim not maybe uh, against the district for the, uh, our land sliding onto theirs and causing damage they have been very they've been in the community 50 years they uh, they came forth and said look let's see what we can do and basically they were just shut down so we're going to be spending money on attorneys there i understand they're about ready to file a lawsuit uh, i don't know what your attorney has told you 
But if you can settle some of these things, you be, you know, th these minor things that really look like they have a, uh, a reasonable solution uh, available, that's the way we should go. We should go into mediation. Now, I remember this, I, I, I don't know, I'm not fully informed in all the issues on the uh, firefighter uh, lawsuit, but I remember when I first heard it, I said, you know, gee, is this really worth the fight? Let's figure this out and let's get to a, a figure real quick. Had we done that, we probably would have saved $50,000. Now, I'm getting pretty pissed as a homeowner that we're spending all this money that is not going to the parks, not going to playgrounds, not going to the rec, not going to uh, salaries and uh, uh, retirements for our employees. This is really bad. We're, we're mismanaging our funds. Now, uh, there's one other uh, uh, legal issue that actually I think we have uh, the, the proper uh, position, and that's when uh, last week you all were informed of this. Uh, a private party went, hired a crew to take down trees that she didn't like uh, shading her backyard. Now, I got the note from the, the general manager saying, well, she's older, she's retired, yada yada, we have to be nice with her. But we have a lot of retired people on the street, and if we're going to allow retired people to cut down trees in our woods, we're, we've got a big problem. This is a second intrusion into Marinwood Park in the last, last six months. And uh, an example needs to be made, Not a, we don't have to go crazy on this, but we should try to get some kind of restitution and send a, a sharp message to residents who think that they can get away with this stuff, okay? Um, the uh, Board of Supervisors had a similar situation. It was felony vandalism, uh, several charges, plus a civil lawsuit estimated to be worth 80,000 bucks. So, for the exact same thing. So protect our park, protect the people uh, of Marinwood, protect the taxpayers and protect the employees, please. We don't need to spend money on lawyers. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Can I just make one more comment? Sure. I, um, I just wanted to correct his dollar amount. It's really around $95,000 in attorney's fees that Marinwood is paying. That's all I want to say. Thank so, you. I, I didn't. I didn't. Anybody else? <clears throat> On with the show. District Manors. We have an announcement of a settlement agreement in terms in the litigation of Anderson et al. versus Marinwood Community Services District. Would you like to? I'm happy to. Is that? The settlement agreement was included in the packet. All the terms are clearly laid out within there. Uh, at the end of the day, the district and the plaintiffs in this lawsuit agreed to settle uh, at the itemized dollar amounts per plaintiff that's in there with the total sum of 10304 The district agreed uh, payment to the plaintiff's attorneys up to $45,000 for their legal fees. I would also say uh, this was submitted to the court on December 22nd. It was uh, approved and the case was dismissed on that same day. Thank you. December 22nd last year? I'm sorry, November 22nd. Yeah. This year. Yeah, this year. Sorry. Okay. Stephen? Um, yeah. Uh, I think this settlement, I just, I'm really pissed off, not that you guys, fire guys, but at the fire department for, for, for the, you know, I've asked the, the CSD to reach out to you. I think you guys need to be reach, reasonable and reach out to us. As a taxpayer, I got to tell you, I don't think we can afford it. We can't afford this, this nonsense. And, um, you know, John Baglio gets 25 bucks. We pay 45 thousand dollars to an attorney. I mean, guys, we, we, 
we want to be on your side, but we can't, we cannot uh, afford this kind of stuff. We need to outsource our, our fire department or merge it or do something else because we can't afford it. We, we clearly can't negotiate. Uh, we're, we're incapable of exactly. dealing with, with issues of this magnitude, the, uh, legal issues. I, I, I think every legal issue that the board has seen has been messed up. And you guys need to, to either talk with some attorneys in the town, you know, as advisors or something. You're trying to interrupt me and I'm, I'm but you're completing my thought. What? You're rambling a lot and you're going I, Okay, would you please review what you can say and what I can say? When I'm speaking, you can't just jump in and say you're rambling a lot. That's, not only is that rude, that's against the Brown Act, that's uh, against some kind of rules, but that doesn't, that doesn't get done. In the back, so you're room. rambling. You are. Okay. You have a point to would make. You, would you, okay, out, he's out of order and you're out of order. Okay? You guys are not far out. You're to lunch. I gave you time, Stephen. Would you, would you knock that down or, or ask him to leave? Please. <laughs> I'll leave if you will. Get out of here, Ron. You know, you really think come you're over here, king come over here, king 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 you asshole. Come on. Oh, come on. You're, you're disgusting. You're a bully. Okay. Yeah, you're a bully. Did we beat this to death yet? I should have like made a comment on me. I wanted to uh, bite in my tongue, but go ahead. All right. Um, I'd like just to try and set the record straight here about this FLSA agreement. I want to put it on the record, and this is factual, that a great deal of time um, and effort was expended by our district manager and upfront legal costs to come through with a proposal that was presented to the lead negotiator, the lead negotiator um, appointed to serve the firefighters. Um, and then that was followed almost the next day by these lawsuits, okay? But that proposal, which was worked on, was evidently either ignored or not presented to the firefighters, and they went ahead with a lawsuit, okay? Um, the total in attorney's fees for a $10,000 payment before taxes came to $102,201, okay? Communication, I would just like to say that the firefighters are public servants. I think they need to consider that they serve the public, not just themselves, and that in the future, communication with the board or with the district manager and the staff will go a long way to getting them in a better place without paying legal fees to the extent we have. Thank you. Okay. Well said, Jeff. You know. <coughs> um, I guess we'll move on. I have a question. Um, I didn't catch what that hundred and two thousand was, Mr. Nail, uh, Mr. Naylor. The hundred and two thousand. I'm sorry. Was I not speaking loud enough? <coughs> I'm, I'm deaf. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll try and say it a little louder. Forty-five thousand dollars to the plaintiff's attorneys. Right. $57,201. That's just what I wanted to know. Thank yes. you very much. Mm -hmm. We paid 57. We the paid district. it all. Yeah, we paid it all. Okay. <laughs> Our taxpayers paid Next it all. time John needs some money, I'll give him 25 bucks. <laughs> uh, we're in with the Emergency <laughs> Services Succession Committee. We're going to discuss it. <laughs> Yes, um, we held our third meeting. Um, we talked about, we actually presented for the first time um, the work to date on a five year past and five year forecast profit and loss statement. Um, it included, I think, the current year and a forecast for the next year. Work is still underway. The intention is to show where the district is going with regard to both revenues and the expenses, including post employment expenses. Um, let's see. 
We also um, had the first presentation um, stemming from our operational subcommittee. We talked generally about the call, uh, the call volume and um, where we're making our calls. Generally speaking, we make about 55% of our calls over the period 2015-2016 into San Rafael or their JP, JPA or mutual aid. Um, also, we discussed several cuts of data that show that about nine, up to 90% of our calls, approximately, are medical assists and public service assists. Where we were going with all this information was, was there anything meaningful that we could do with regard to staff and or assets um, to better meet our actual requirements? Um, those discussions will continue. Um, some of the ideas that were um, proposed met with a certain amount of resistance, but we will still look into them. Um, I want to also mention that um, you know we did we did consider um, rolling stock, the fire engines, and the utility vehicles. And discussions will continue on both those fronts. Next, uh, the chief has said that he has sufficient information to initiate talks with the three different um, organizations that we've identified as candidates for potential merger and or outsourcing. Um, and which are uh, Novato, County Fire, San Rafael. What about Cal Fire? We haven't considered them at this point. No, no, I, no, think no. They're, I think they're Ray County Fire. Ray County Fire is your Cal Fire agency in this county. Yeah. So that's the same as County Fire. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. And the only other topic I wanted to bring up, um, and I think we're going to have to pull, is that the next uh, the next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, January second. <coughs> we're thinking that possibly it might we might want to um, step out of bounds a little bit and defer that until perhaps Thursday the fourth. Um, but again, we're going to have to you know, discuss that with the committee and see if they're willing to meet at that time. I just think that's a little too close to the holidays for our next meeting. Um, any questions on any of that? Linda? I would like to know what is being done to get this communication out, speaking of communication, get communication out to residents. Mm -hmm. I know that you put a little blur about on next door maybe, or something, mm -hmm. I think. But I had suggested a couple of times now that we print out cheap flyers that lots of volunteers could drop flyers on 60 houses, no, 50, 50 houses a minute. In my estimation, when I was canvassing, it took one hour to drop 50 flyers on 50 doorsteps, excluding the estates. Um, does anybody want to do that? Is there anybody who wants to volunteer one little teeny so, teeny an hour? I, I mean, I think it's a great idea. I don't think we're at the point of having anything to communicate to the public about yet. So I, I, I just don't think we're at that stage yet. But I, I think it's a good idea that you know we can hold for the future when we are ready. Okay, thank you. But um, part of that communication is trying to get two <coughs> new members of the public to right. be added to And I think realistically, in all of our experiences with every committee and the board, it's hard to get public members to volunteer for this. So we can spend all our time and resources changing, at, char searching and charging after these elusive community members that we probably aren't going to find. And if you know anybody, great. But if we can't find people internally and we've advertised, there is a point where we need to get on with our work and just keep going. And that's not our focus. That's not the main focus at this point. But it sounds like there's no communication, or not good enough communication to the public to get anyone to volunteer. And I know what you're saying, because obviously, look who's here. Right, so but the, I mean, this, this question comes up at every other board meeting, and it's come up at every other board meeting for the past 12 years that I've been sitting in this room. So it's nothing new, and we're not gonna solve it tonight. But I mean, I, I, I hear you. <coughs> I'm putting some together for Leah to consider before we reach out to those other agencies. Just kind of a common thing that we can send to the three of them. So, very good. Anything else? 
That's it. Okay. Um, we have a resolution on the board. Yeah, this resolution came from SCRMA. It's actually their language. The resolution is that it gave you a pretty detailed memo as to what this uh, was regarding. I also wanted to make it very clear uh, the board of directors are currently covered and have been for some time in our workers' comp policy. It amounts to all of $106 total annually to uh, include all five of you. Um, that's not each. That's total. It's like 21 23 <coughs> per year per director. Uh, electing to remain, continue the same coverage, I'm told by SDRMA, will not have any impact uh, on what you're covered for, nor how much it costs to cover them. I think this is just a, uh, uh, something, one of their excess barriers that should be provided as further documentation that the board wants this included in their coverage. Uh, if you were to elect other coverages, as you can see down there, uh, for other types of volunteers. I don't have actual costings um, or rates on that, but if you were to go that direction, it would change our current policy that we've had, and I can certainly look into it. We can bring this back to the table uh, next month with that information if you want to. So, so does this mean we're covered, but the volunteers, like for the festival, you know, the events that they put on, parking rec puts on, the volunteers that offer their services for free uh, covered in the correct they are not currently covered although I would say we don't have a heck of a lot of them yeah. most of the people working the events are actually our rec staff but they are generally paid for those events because you can't really have staff people volunteering for events well I was thinking in a particular instance if uh, if Linda's wish came through for volunteers distributing pamphlets for meetings, they have to be covered in uh, that instance. They would not uh, have to be covered. You could elect to cover them. Right, I know, but if something happened, you know, I'm just thinking out loud. That would be an, it's an interesting question. I don't have a direct answer for you. Like they tripped as they were walking from house to house. Right. It speaks to the board of directors. Does it cover commissioners as well? Or no, it does not. Okay. Only the governing body. Okay, thank you. Is this an annual thing or is this a No, one this thing? is a brand new thing. Okay. Yeah. One time, maybe, hopefully. That's my understanding. Unless you want to change <coughs> down the line at which point you do a new one. No. Go ahead. Uh, on the resolution. Is it your intention not to check any of those boxes? No, my intention was to see if uh, what the district wanted to do. I didn't want to get presumptive. Uh, right now, the top box would be checked according to what we currently have. The, but, okay. so, I, I don't understand why if we want to cover ourselves per workers' comp, why we don't at least cover the two commission members, two commissions, their members, and maybe even other volunteers, as we're mentioned here, I, I, I do work for some nonprofits where all the volunteers are covered under workers' comp. I don't know what the if there's a cost differential. Well, I'm sure there is. I don't know what it is, but I can certainly. I mean, if you look at some of these things, uh, the meals, trips, is under reimbursement. I mean, I think the second box is kind of what Jeff was alluding to. We don't have work study programs and or interns. Other volunteers would probably uh, or designate would be for the fire commission and the park and rec commission if you wanted to do that route. Uh, it would, I don't know, it would appear to be the first two boxes already checked. <coughs> then what I would suggest, if uh, that's the case, is I would bring this back to SDRMA and I would ask them to provide me with a quote. For adding that, they probably need some level of numbers on how many volunteers uh, we have, how many persons we have performing voluntary services without pay on an annual basis. I would assume that number to be pretty low. Well, I assume I, that's the only way to bring into this the commissioners. Am I correct? Um, no, I would. If you look at the very bottom box, 
um, you could designate the commissions. And what about like the secession committee has some people volunteering on it that aren't commissioners? It just you can designate that as well. Yeah. They would probably just want a total count. And then to your point, uh, you have two board members on that, two staff people on that. Uh, in fact, right now there is nobody that isn't either a you have two commissioners serving on that. Otherwise, everybody else is either a board member or an employee. Is there a time frame in which we have to? Uh, they didn't give one. They just said as soon as you could. Uh, I don't think there would be any problem with going back to them, getting some more information if you'd like it for the next board meeting, and putting it back on the agenda. If you don't, if you want to look at it beyond maintaining the status quo, I think we almost have to. Sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, I guess at the end of it. It's always going to be an increased expense. So, no, I know that. I mean, I would suggest we not look into it any further and do not expose ourselves anymore and just kind of leave it at this. But, I mean, I don't want to deny the request for information either, so, uh, yeah. Can we declare one way, get further information, and then change our minds later? I would assume you can, uh, that is my question I asked specifically, yeah. but uh, I'm sure you can in that instance. I don't, I don't think that, you know, they certainly, I literally just got this last week. Yeah. Um, I don't think they expected to be turned around in six days. I just had it, it was there, I wanted to put it out there, get it, make everybody aware. I can easily uh, uh, make note of the questions here. Add uh, what it would cost to add this, add that, <coughs> add the other thing. Uh, uh, report back that information and you can make that decision next month on whether you want to add these people that have never been an aspect of our workers compensation policy mm -hmm. um, and I think the governing board just is by policy of the not necessarily us but of the uh, SDRMA previously basically just said your governing body gets added and all they do is work with government agencies special districts specifically okay table of this one. Sure. Sounds good. Can I make a comment? Go ahead, Steve. Um, well, actually, a question first. What is the need for this? Work in, workers comp for sitting in a meeting. Eric? <clears throat> What is the need for workers' comp sitting in a meeting? I'm not sure I understand your question, Steve. I'm sorry. You're putting people on workers' comp. Why do you need to put them on workers' comp? I mean, they haven't, as far as I know, there's been zero compensation, zero benefits associated with this uh, <coughs> position. So what is the need? Well, the governing body has always been covered as long as I've been here. This predates me. Um, They've been a part of the uh, policy uh, for as long as I know. Uh, so this is so maybe I don't understand. I, I, weren't you adding these people? Adding them? No, we're not adding them. As I clearly stated in here, they're already on our workers' comp at a cost of one hundred and six dollars annually as part of our workers' comp bill. They're already on there. The board is covered. These other items that they have mentioned are what they are saying. What would it cost us to add? So that we're, okay. So what? Basically, the the quandary now is how how much workers comp that you that the, you well the quandary is if they want to cover other other people other people. All right. Well, it's only taxes. District manager report. No question, manager. Go ahead. Just a quick question. Uh, this resolution uh, that's declaring uh, volunteers. To be deemed employees of the district. Does that include volunteer firefighters? So they no, it's stated in there in my memo. Actually, volunteer firefighters are a completely different classification. They're already covered. They have nothing to do with this resolution. Okay. Moving on. Moving on. It's not the chief. It's all good. Uh, okay. Uh, at the last board meeting, it was asked for a detailed update on where we were with FEMA and the storm-related property damage. I tried to break it down as detailed as I could. Um, 
without necessarily going through all of those things, I would just say on the Miller Creek Bank erosions, claims one of two, I am uh, expecting, I've been informed by Miller Pacific that they should have uh, their report by the end of this week in my hands in a draft version to read, uh, send back any comments or uh, questions I may have, and then it would be finalized. Uh, from there, I will pass it along to FEMA so that they can finalize their project worksheets. Uh, uh, again, I want to rate for the report for their formal opinion, but I would say uh, all informal conversations have been positive and they don't see a uh, dire situation and don't envision recommending uh, large-scale pro projects at either of those two areas by which to shore the Creek Bank. Um, so I think that's good. So I would wait for theirs. Uh, as far as claims three, four, and five, um, I made mention and I can do with the chief um, in just in terms of an update on progress for uh, Queenstone. The vegetation management portion of the project has been done. There's piles up there that the Tam's fuel crew is waiting to burn until it gets to be a little bit safer environment. Um, and we're also waiting for Marine County's supply dozer operator and a dozer to work with uh, the contract we have with Tim Bass to complete the grading project. Again, we have to wait until basically we're out of fire season, which doesn't look like it's coming anytime soon. Yeah. At least a couple of months. Yeah. We could use some heavy rains, but. Uh. Mm -hmm. uh, good. And then claims six, seven, and eight that are on there are actually done. Um, these are all things that happened during or immediately following <coughs> the uh, storm event. Uh, everything's been submitted in total, submitted $11,550 in eligible expense for these claims. Uh, it's my understanding it's already been approved. Um, of course, we won't get reimbursed the full 11550 because that's not the way the funding formula works. We'll get 75% of that back from federal and then 75% of the remaining amount back from Cal OES, which if you do all the math, I believe equals 93.5% total. Um, they like to think it's difficult. Um, but anyway, all of that is said and done, and that was just for actions that we took, things like the sand that was purchased, staff time that was in there, uh, use of equipment, um, the tree and debris that occurred during the event, um, things along those lines, basically protective measures put in place uh, immediately uh, prior to and during and immediately following. Uh, Any idea on timing? No. Next year, obviously. <laughs> obviously, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't have any idea on timing in terms of even on this one that's been done, submitted, approved, when we would expect to see uh, payment. That's not something that uh, even if I asked it necessarily it's release because it goes through several layers of uh, bureaucracy before checks actually get cut and signed. Okay, thanks. Uh, and then on the park maintenance facility, I uh, was asked for an update on that. I have included a robust biological site assessment that was performed by a company called Pernuski Chatham. They are actually on the uh, pre-approved list of vendors for these types of reports at the county, uh, which is the primary reason why we use them. Uh, you've seen the report. I've kind of highlighted a couple things from it uh, in terms of next steps. We're continuing to develop a site plan review application that will be submitted to the county as part of that. Uh, I am awaiting a, a final topographic map of the current area, facility, facility area. Uh, that will be included as part of that, uh, as well as I'm reaching out to local uh, design architects to submit proposals for initial building design based on the internal needs. Uh, assessment that we have already conducted uh, internally. The, uh, all of those, as well as the rendering for that site, all of those would be put together uh, in addition to the biological site assessment would be included as part of the site plan review application, at which point we would get more formal feedback from the county as to the viability of that location and any restrictions, challenges uh, that they may have to that. That's not applying for building permits, that's simply a site plan process. I've asked them a couple other questions to make sure that uh, is there anything else we need prior to if the district were to decide to uh, submit for uh, uh, actual building and as well as demolition permits. Uh, other items of note, um, the 
1617 audit is all but completed. Actually, the auditor was in the office uh, today, uh, got the last pieces of documentation he needed from us, as well as uh, his backup documentation. He said everything looks very good. Yeah, I do not anticipate any levels of observations or findings, and I also anticipate several prior year findings to be uh, noted as uh, completed and resolved. Um, which I think is great, um, a good step forward for all of us. Um, I do not, given the holidays, the fact he was in here today, which was kind of the earliest we could get him, I do not think he'll have his report completed and ready to present for the January meeting. Um, so it will most likely be presented at the February meeting, that's when it was also presented last year. Um, but he's going to try his darndest to see if he can't uh, get it done. But realistically, I would be surprised if it's not. February when it gets presented. Uh, with that said, I think I'm anticipating a very clean audit with uh, no current year observations. Sounds great. Good. Any questions? Linda? I do have a question about the park maintenance shed stuff that's been going on. Um, I'd like to ask the district manager how much so far we've spent on, I don't know, inspections and studies and designs and that kind of stuff? Um, the only thing I really spent was on this particular biological site assessment. I don't have the number immediately in front of me, but I want to say it was about $4,000 to conduct So you haven't spent anything on drawings and plans? And hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Steve? Yeah. Um, Okay, so yeah, a couple items, he listed quite a few. Um, with regards to the maintenance shed, um, everyone should be aware that that riverbank that the shed sits on is unstable and during a storm situation could further erode. This is what happened before my time, probably what, 20 years ago, I'm sure the chief could tell you exactly when, but um, it was built up with uh, concrete blocks illegally, by the way. And the, just the simple location of that shed is very problematic. Um, in addition, it's an industrial facility uh, with industrial chemicals and uh, stuff that's really bad for the environment. I go by there, I smell uh, the chemicals in the air, so I know you're storing chemicals in there. And um, you, when we had the meeting about it, it was very clear, Linda notwithstanding, that there was a strong sentiment in the room against that location. And the reason being is that that's our park, and uh, it really could be uh, relocated easily uh, in this area where all the rest of the staff is. Um, Secondly, on this report, there's no mention of the uh, intrusion uh, into our park. And I don't know if you, any of you have had a neighbor hop over the fence and cut down trees on your land, but I'm sure if that happened, you would be calling the sheriff and possibly suing that individual. I got a letter back after pointing this out. Uh, from Eric saying, gee, it's not that she's retired and we'll deal with it internally. Like, you know, poor woman, that she didn't know any better. She surely knew better. She's lived there for 40 odd years. Um, but anyhow, I would like to hear a report where it stands now. Is this, are you going to ignore it? Have you guys decided and just don't want to tell anybody? What's, what's going on? Stephen, can I interrupt for just one? second. That has nothing at all to do. I, I don't remember seeing anything like that in this report that we were talking about. Okay, so if you want to wait until we get to requests for future actually agenda items. Okay, be no, 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 no. I, I'm, you, you weren't listening to what I said. I, I was critiquing, excuse me, you like to interrupt me and you're, you really need to kind of break that off, okay? We can have a, a civil uh, interaction, but it, it's not going to be 
you interrupting me and me interrupting you, okay? I was simply commenting on the manager's report and lack of information on this, okay? What gets discussed in future agendas is also probably pretty important. But let's hear what the manager has to say because there was interaction, I know, know that. It wasn't on the report. Okay, then your manager is not reporting everything that's important to the district. That's a problem. Okay, thank you. Hey, Anybody you know, else? you do represent the public here. It's not, it, you're not like a ruling body where you, you're, you're not an oligarchy here. Thank you. That was nice. Well, I am number one. I know that. <laughs> you treat me with respect, I'll treat you with respect. Yeah. Fire department matters. Any right. question on the commission minutes? I do. Yes. Uh, item number five, succession planning for the implementation of paramedics and hiring options. Uh, I joined the fire commission almost two years ago now, January 2016, and this item was on the agenda then. And I'm wondering how far back does this go? This comes out of a request from Jeff Naylor. I think Jeff was on the fire commission at the time. And, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, feel free to jump in. But it had to do with uh, wanting to keep the board apprised of where we were as far as bringing paramedics on board in the fire department and having them be able to work as paramedics in the fire department. So it's just kind of been a standing agenda item at both the commission and the board just to let you know where we currently sit along those lines. How many years have we been talking about? That's what I'm wondering. Since April oh. 2014. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have lived in the district now a little over 51 years. I've called the fire department three times. They were all three paramedic calls, and I got a nice ride over to the hospital each time. Probably the reason I'm here is because the paramedics came the last time and took me to the hospital. Uh, I'm interested in this, and, and it seems to just go on and on and on. You, in your report of November 1, Chief, said that you now have three paramedics on your staff. Correct. And what I'm two of the, Dr. Kenya, two of them are on shift. Yeah, one one's undergoing initial training. 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 But they're not um, official. That, well, that's part of my question. Um, yes. But you call you call them firefighters. They're not called firefighter paramedics. Right. What what does this mean? What's the difference if they were what they're they're certified by the state? I guess as paramedics. They're certified by the state and in the county. But when can they operate as paramedics? Um, mm -hmm. When the position, the details of the position are negotiated successfully with the board, between the board and the labor group. Until then, they cannot operate as paramedics in our department. They and just we, do they, EMT sort of They do, yeah, EMT, DLS level. Now, if, if and when they get, we get a paramedic program, what additional pro services can those paramedics provide? There's some additional, again, I, I could defer to a paramedic in the room, but um, there'll be some additional equipment that uh, will be given to us by San Rafael, uh, along with some additional drugs um, that they'll be able to push on the scene of specific EMS emergencies. Because um, yeah. I remember, you know, the, the engine crew came to my house, they did a great job of doing, got all my vitals together and everything. Eventually the paramedics got there and, and they then gave me a shot at something. Yeah. We're lucky we, op we operate in a system where our paramedics are pretty much on our heels, mm -hmm. which are helpful, but there are calls where occasionally a more rapid ALS level intervention by an engine company crew would be allow for a, a better outcome to the emergency. That's, that's I agree. Yeah. Uh, to, when we do this negotiating with the firemen, the, the paramedics are going to get some additional, uh, uh, what, I'll call it a pay incentive or something. Yeah, so, yeah. Know, pay differential. And uh, who's going to pay for that? San Rafael. And so right now, but San Rafael has gotten money from the Rimwood taxpayers, am I correct? Right. So we've been paying for this service to San Rafael all the time, and they're basically just pocketing the money. It could be some of the money. Some of the money. I realize it pays for part of the 
the paramedic yeah, ambulance they're, they're, those guys. They're paying for, I think it's 18 positions as well as the two ambulances. So you're paying for the service and you've been getting that service provided by CRFL. The question came up with about five to six, seven years ago, CRFL started putting a paramedic on their engine company. So there was a slightly higher level of service in the areas that those engine companies serve the community. Rimwood was interested in having that same level of service here, hence it was included in the shared services agreement three years ago. So we pay for it but don't get it yet? Well, not technically, because you're paying a lower level for your um, your paramedic fee than all the other areas of paramedic service area B. And that's one of the areas that the board has not raised our paramedic fee up to the level that the rest of Serafell pays for, is because they're of the opinion, and I tend to support it, that we're not getting exactly the same level of service. So we're going to increase our ex costs to San Rafael when we certify, if that's the right word, our, our paramedics? I w they currently pay $4 more with a ceiling of 110 We currently pay $85. Um, they're all paying 89 But when our par when there's a paramedic working as a paramedic on your engine company in Marinewood, I would suggest you revisit the paramedic tax in our area and raise it up to the level that San Rafael pays. Okay, so what I seem to conclude from this is that uh, this would be, you know, if we had a paramedic program, it'd be an increase in level of service to our taxpayers and residents. Correct. Um, it would allow some of our firefighters to get some, I'll call it, I'll call it reimbursement for the time and effort and energy they spent in getting certified. And it's going to cost us almost nothing, if anything, to add this service. I can't argue with anything you just said. I sure wish we would move on with getting a paramedic program going here. Mm -hmm. We don't need to wait till somebody dies. How many years has it been going on? Since 2014. April 2014. We should suspend payments. Thank you, Chief. Can I clarify something? <coughs> the, the comments about the paramedic tax, that would be a ballot measure. Just right. you know, The district doesn't have the ability to impose something like that. The, the district can put it on the ballot, uh, but it would be a ballot measure and have to be approved by the voters to increase any level of paramedic tax. Right now, it caps at 85, and we currently, uh, as residents, pay the cap amount of 85, the max amount possible. Anything else? I have another subject on the uh, minutes. I'm oh, okay. sorry to keep doing this, but I, I'm interested. I, uh, the section I on, want to talk about fire action. The section on vegetation management. I actually went to the website and found the section uh, where we allow our residents to do certain mow grass and small brush. Up it, trees. It's about what it says. It doesn't say anything about living up trees, I don't believe. Yeah, I, I, when I meet with residents, I suggest they limit up six to ten feet or one third the height of the tree. My, my, I guess my concern was that based on what I hear about the concern of the defensible space uh, in areas adjacent to uh, open space and the creek and other areas, not the park where, where someone did some defensible space behind quietly. But, uh, I, I just think this needs to be looked at to maybe be a little more forthcoming, more aggressive on letting people clear, you know, brush down wood. Down wood takes a permit or something, it says here. Uh, if, if an oak tree dies and lays on the ground, uh, supposedly that can't be taken up without a special permit. And I just think we ought to, I think people ought to be able to clear, except for live trees, within 100 feet of their property without going through any rigmarole. And they ought to be able to limb those live trees up, uh, as you were just saying, and it ought to be in here. And I think the section might even be retitled instead of wildfire prevention. It ought to be changed to defensible space. That appears to be the buzzword. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I think some updates there. This is definitely a hot topic right now. That's, why I, that's my suggestion. And I, I can tell you that people, punch that up. I'm getting a lot of calls and meeting with a lot of homeowners on this and people want the district to take care of it and be responsible for it. And I let them know we just don't have the resources, the money, or the personnel to do that, but we do allow them to go on to the property to do what's required. It's not necessarily the most popular answer, but it's the best one I can give them. 
Can I ask that policy? Is it, we mimic basically the county's policy on this. Right? We, we mimic uh, Marin County Open Space District right. policy. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, you still. That's it. I just, I just think it ought to be punched up, made a little easier for people to do a better job behind their houses. Go ahead, cool. Stephen. Okay, so 100 feet. Herb, you, you got me scared. That's that's a lot of space you're talking about uh, for defensible space. I, I can see six feet, perhaps. But you know, uh, the Marinwood Park is is different than up near your neighborhood. Um, uh, Excuse me for interrupting. The park isn't in this discussion. It's it's, it's very clear. It's open space. You know, yeah, that's a. But this is the park parcel here where you're over. Here. That's so that's that, that's different. that's true. Okay, so if you'd like me to speak specifically to open space, a hundred feet is way way too much. That's 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 a lot of land you're talking about. How far would beg to differ with you? You're going to let people send. You're going to send their crews and, and clear a hundred foot swath of land. I'm not going to. Oh, but we will residents. allow them to do it. Authority to the residents on our land. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That we own, we maintain, and is for the nature. And, and we don't maintain it. Well. Okay. I I really strongly disagree with that policy. I think that's your your uh, we're we're advocating the responsibility and maintenance of the land to our neighbors, and that's why we don't have a, we should have a consistent policy. But uh, is open space, they allow 100 uh, feet? Yes. San Rafael uh, has it as well. Oh, if they allow it, they encourage it. Encourage it. Ron, mm -hmm. uh, just like to let everyone know, County Service Area 13 requires a 100 foot break behind back fences. That, uh, for homes okay. that back up onto the hills, and each individual homeowner is responsible for doing it. And 99% of the homeowners in CSA 13 in Upper Lucas Valley have cut a 100 foot fire break. And if you talk to anybody in the fire protection industry, they'll tell you 100 feet is the minimum they would like. If you saw what happened in Sonoma County, if you see what's happening down south, we get 40 and 50 mile an hour winds here in Lewis Valley. And six feet is, you know, that's a joke. A uh, hundred feet is the bare minimum uh, for public safety uh, as far as a fire break. And we have gotten compliance uh, by going door to door by writing letters and uh, by telling people under the state resources code we can take legal action if they don't do it. Now our open space in CSA 13 is not part of the open space district in Marin County. It is just county owned land, period. Not part of open space. So uh, the rules are different and we're allowed to have people go behind their back fence and cut these 100 foot breaks without getting a permit, without asking permission. They're allowed to do it in the hopes of enhancing public safety for themselves and their neighbors. And what, what CSA 13 does with the help of guys like Ron and Kelby Jones is pretty impressive. It's, yeah. uh, it's a very good job. And again, like he said, our open space is Marinwood's open space. We can adjust that policy to read however we want. When the board initially adopted it, we just used what Marin County Parks, Marin County Open Space had used. So they were similar because we had a lot of lands that kind of border them. But I like what you say, let's make it as simple as possible on our residents. Okay, sir. In the city of San Rafael, the uh, city council passed an uh, amendment that says clear back 100 feet from the house. And they had the fire department going out there knocking on doors saying, you've got to clear out your space. And I asked to be, be aware of the cost to the elderly who don't have the kind of money to redo their yard. Uh, they went after Juniper in particular. 
and they, were, and, uh, they arranged to have the, the city arranged to pay the cost of having a chipper come out to the house. If they dug it up, they cleared it, then they chip it the all away. Uh, tremendous success. And I personally got involved in 500 homes of clearing the juniper out of their yards at no cost to the uh, homeowner. But they did go through a lot of cost to clean a new yard in and get rid of the old stuff. But the city of Santa Fe was uh, like probably, probably 700 homes by now. They're, I've been involved in the program for the last six years or so. Thank you. Anybody? Linda? Well, to add on to this gentleman's information about San Rafael, they, and I think some of you have heard me say this before, San Rafael has a full-time vegetation management manager, and they're adding a half a person as well. And talk about knocking on doors. They try to enforce really well. They use properties and they funds for that project. Yes. And here, um, the board doesn't want to use property funds. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I guess that's good. Fire department kitchen remodel project advised staff on project scope, appliances and material specifications and associated requests for bids. Um, the only question I have is, has, has it been amended from the last time to get rid of the, let's say, demolition of a soffit that doesn't There's a couple of uh, a couple of adjustments for me in the new bid that's before you to help the verb and Eric specifically. Um, a couple of things were removed like the soffit, a couple of things were taken out of the and jump in any time, were taken out of the main bid section and moved to like an alternate bid section. So we get a main bid price and then three items were taken out of the main bid and moved to an alternate bid. So we can uh, consider it separately. See if there's some say one there. Yeah what we the, I haven't seen the final version. But basically, the refrigerator is an add-on. It's not in the base bid. The uh, lowering the pony wall between the counters and the day room uh, has been left in because that should be less expensive than taking it down and moving the electrical and plumbing out of it. The cabinets, the, the countertops have gone to laminate in the base bid with an add-on of the quartz that was uh, originally proposed. I don't think so. That's not no, you didn't do that? that? No. Okay, that was talked about. Uh, the uh, under, under counter, counter lighting was a uh, add on ahead. now. So everything is still there, but there's a base bid that can be uh, gone with. And, and if somehow you get a, a, a palatable bid, uh, you could add some things if, it, if it's found to be warranted. The, you know, the, what you know, it was. I don't know, the, the particular contractor that was the low bidder on the last go around, he left thirty thousand dollars on the table. In other words, the next bidder, which was the only other bidder, was thirty thousand dollars above him. So he had no desire whatsoever to negotiate with us. He figured he had us over a barrel, and uh, it's unfortunate. But uh, the solution was to reject the bids and start the process yeah. over again. Yeah. So, okay. What besides the refrigerator was taken out? The well, soffit was well, removed because there isn't one. I'm sorry. The soffit was removed completely. Oh, well, there is no soffit. And yeah. then the uh, under cabinet lighting was moved from the base bid to right. the alternate bid. What about the stove, the gas stove? Stove and base bed. Gas stove stays. Yeah. Thank you. And, and the full backsplash was removed. To the four inch backsplash. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. and, right, and you're leaving the, the, the pony wall up at its, its current height? That became a bit alternative okay. in this draft. Um, and I know, uh, again, I achieved this speak for myself. We're splitting hairs with something like that. Let's just get this out. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you reach out and were able to get in touch with the architect and all of that? Yeah, I'm going to hopefully have the plans tomorrow. Go. Okay. So, I have a question. Um, in reading some of the factual information about Senate Bill 854, 
um, I came across language that um, basically described what a public works project is. Under the labor code, public works in general refers to construction, alteration, demolition, installation, maintenance, or repair work done under contract and paid for in whole or in part of public funds. Now, I, I have a told question. I that eight months ago. Sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Trying to understand this, I just want to ask hypothetically, if someone, do someone made a donation and purchased an appliance, okay, and donated the appliance to the district as opposed to donating funds to the district, could we remove that appliance from the bid and send it out without it. So I've been of the opinion that this whole project should have been below the radar of SB 854. Well, and I know you may not like hearing that, but that's just one guy's opinion, so. Sure, and after we just got finished with the FLSA, do you want us to go down the road of having some more litigation? Do you, I mean, seriously. No, I don't, Jeff, but I'm telling you this project would never have been questioned. And I've said that since day one. Okay, well. I mean, entirely, I mean, is there any merit to what I just asked? I, I defer to for all merits and purposes. Legal. If if we had someone pay for a stove and donate it, could it be removed from a construction project? That's not a question for me. I believe so. I mean, okay. in, in essence, you wouldn't be providing a new stove as part of the. I think project. you would have a stove and you would just have yeah. PG and E come in and hook it up, right? Sure, that's what they do. I mean, Actually, that's not nine thousand dollars, in my opinion. Um, you know, there are ways. I think we could have made this a little bit more palatable, a little bit more cost friendly to the district. Is my point. And that means not deferring the stove, not deferring the refrigerator, if we had them purchased and donated, we could put them in service right away. The, the, the concept works, that, that you mentioned, Jeff, works for the refrigerator uh, because it can just be slid into place. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned that the stove, PG&E doesn't make installations like that. A, a contractor makes installations of stoves. We have a hookup, right? It still takes someone to install it. My concern is that the stove fits between two cabinets. And if it's a half inch too small, who's responsible for fixing that cabinet? That's why I think it's important that the stove be a part of the contract. Same with the dishwasher. Uh, so that there's no question. It's part of the contract. The contractor has to make it all fit. Pay contractors' prices and pay their overhead. Okay. I mean, you could the concept of we supply the stove and they have they're responsible for installing it probably could work if somebody donated a stove. To your point, or do you need to give the contractor uh, the exact specs? Yeah. Prior to uh, finalizing design of the cabinets or any of that kind of stuff, because that will. Play in the, so that they can get wash them out. Yes. And one further thing I'd like to mention just before I squelch. I don't think we're being good stewards of public funds by demolishing perfectly serviceable cabinets and um, paying someone to haul them away. That's all I have to say. This is a thorough review, correct? Yeah, right now, I mean, ultimately, uh, uh, staff, albeit the chief and myself, are looking for any further direction on what you've been presented with um, and kind of moving forward from there. You know, kind of specific, uh, some level of a board consensus uh, direction that we can incorporate into this. From there, this is going to go through a legal review as soon as that is completed. We'll put out the uh, RFP, <coughs> and I believe so we have that timing uh, ideal right now. Yeah, depending on 
when we get this out. Uh, yeah. Uh, of, uh, ideally, being able to open up the next round of bids by January 19th. I think the sooner the better. Yeah. We just wanted to allow plenty of turnaround time while also recognizing holidays are in play. Um, I do want this uh, to go through a level of legal review. Uh, and that will happen by a person who served as the lead attorney for the County Department of Public Works for four years. So he's gone through several of these and has already offered the review of forms. So, uh, Bill, would it be appropriate for the board to make a motion that we authorize the staff once the plans and specs are uh, completed to go out to bid? I know for I the normal public works projects, the public agency board usually authorizes the bidding of the project. Do we need to do that now? We don't want to wait till the next meeting. No, you certainly can. I, I, I don't know that we necessarily need authorization to put something out to bid uh, in a formal manner. I think we need authorization to accept any level of a contract. I think that's all we need to do, just directing them to get it out there as quickly as possible. Your call. I don't think we need that motion. The, the I only didn't time make it, I just asked about it. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I think if we can get this out as quickly as possible, that's our, I'll, that's what I need. That's what I want. Okay. And then again, I just want to be very clear on what we're asking for. If there's any other refinement, any level of anything that needs to be made to this before we do that, because once it's out, it's out. Uh, I like this method of doing these bid alternatives. I think that's a much cleaner approach, personally, than. Uh, the first go around on this uh, it makes it cleaner to kind of pick and choose and uh, based on my conversations with uh, the legal representative said yeah that's a good way to do it uh, so I don't know what other suggestions or as presented here it's ready to go what the uh, that's what I'm looking for okay um, I thought in the last bid process there was comment about um, being too general and what we were asking as replies from the, from the contractors, i.e. cost of goods versus overhead, et cetera, et cetera. Has there been anything in there to clarify that? No, Apparently it's not included in uh, overhead and um, his, the, his profit margins aren't itemized. Typically as aren't itemized. As a rule. Yeah. Okay. That was all just a part of a smoke screen that contractor put up. He wanted to keep the job. It, <laughs> obviously, when someone bids for you know purchase an installation of a stove, it includes profit and overhead and administrative costs and everything that goes into the job. Yeah, like okay. the painting. Yeah, but I will specifically ask legal on the language above the bid schedule if any of that language should be included in there, stating please be sure to. It, it is in there. I saw it somewhere. Include any levels of. Profit, overhead, so on and so forth. Supervision fees. So that's where the legal review will be able to get some more of that kind of a language. You know, no, nothing has changed. The law hasn't changed. Not since the last time. Uh, okay. Twenty-five thousand dollars is the threshold for public bidding, sealed bids. Any project expected to exceed twenty-five thousand dollars needs to go through the sealed bid process. Okay. So, um, I think it was last meeting. I was complaining about a forty-five hundred dollar uh, zero stove or whatever it is. I don't know. More expensive than I'd be willing to pay. And uh, fireman said, "Well, I've got a five thousand dollar stove." Now, <coughs> no oven. So. Uh, I went into Home Depot the other day, GE, really nice gas stove, six burners, 600 bucks. We can get this done for under 25,000 if we have the guts to do it and move ahead. <coughs> I agree, the chief came with a good bid day one. We had this project all set to go and then there was a misunderstanding about the law. But it, since nothing has changed, let's go back to that. I'm, I'm really kind of burnt by the idea that we spent $107,000 for this silly little lawsuit. 102. To 100, 102, whatever it was. 
I think we spent the money that we should spend on the fire department in, in that area. And let's just get something going. We can have it by Christmas and uh, celebrate Christmas in the firehouse. That's all I have to say. Does anyone have any changes to what the proposed? If you don't, you can keep moving. I'm thinking we'll probably wait till Thursday to get it out, so feel free to email us any suggestions. I would just like some clarification. When did you say you thought maybe it would go out to the public? After it goes through a legal review. So maybe mid January? No, I would expect they should be able to turn a new amount in the end of the year. The year? Uh, ideally, less than a week from the time we put it in their hand. Okay, so you don't know. I, I don't have an exact timing on how long it'll take them to review it. And, and give how back long will you be keeping the good. posting out? Ideally, uh, nothing okay. less than 30 days. Thank you. We done? Fire activity? Um, only that our engine is still down in, they're currently at the, the Thomas Fire in Santa Barbara. And the new firefighter paramedics started last week. We're doing some in-house training with them. Hope to have them on shift sometime February, March-ish. Awesome. That'll proceed San Rafael's Fire Academy. Unclear on when San Rafael's the new hire academy is going to be. I heard it might possibly be pushed out until April, which means if he went through that, he wouldn't be ready to go on shift until mid to late May. But uh, if that's their timeline, I'm of the opinion that we can get him up to speed and train him in house much earlier than that. Fire Commission meeting? We are not going to meet on January 2nd. Thank you. Park and Rec. Draft minutes of the Park and Rec Commission meeting. Uh, sure. Uh, any questions? Can I just wait to go up here? All the rates are going to come to you uh, next month. You guys are going to be Minor. Yeah. I saw three what three percent. Yeah, three percent. Um, mm -hmm. Some areas have gone up some more. The pool membership's going up, camp going up, drop the base line going up. That's in line with everybody else's. Yeah. It's kind of over each year. Does that have anything to do with the increase in the pay rates for the minimum minimum wage? Yeah, it's just gonna keep us moving. Yeah, again, a boost. Was that every year until like twenty twenty when it's gonna be up to fifteen dollars an hour? <sighs> Ten fifty. It'll be, uh, I believe, eleven dollars on January first. Then it goes up uh, by dollar increments until it reaches fifteen dollars. Yeah, it's going to be an impact. Could be worse. It could be San Francisco. Right. I mean, it's been amazing. It took this long, though. I was, I pulled up something for when I was a kid, making like five dollars an hour. So thinking about it like that, <laughs> that's like you know, that was a really long time ago. Yeah, we we have a few positions, obviously, that pay minimum wage. Uh, so those will be impacted and we'll have to go up. Yeah. And then we try to keep an eye on uh, what's happening in other areas too. I mean, like guards and things like that are in short supply and hard to get. Do we have any programs that are impacted, at, let's say adversely, by non-resident members where a little more differenti differentiation between resident and non-resident fees may uh, not scare all the non-residents away, but uh, so yeah, we have program at a better level. We currently have a, um, a difference between resident and non-resident with like our summer camps, pool memberships, pool drop-ins. So there's already a difference in price. Oh, I understand that. Well, I think, you know, is, is the difference, let's say in, in particular programs, 
so, let's say, small that uh, we're getting, we, we have such a good deal for the folks that live in the neighborhood here, they come, come to us rather than going to the Terra Linda Rec Center to the detriment of our program by overcrowding it. No, it's something we keep, I personally think no, it's something we keep an eye on each year. Um, we get a lot of participants because, with camps, for instance, because we're kind of the only game in town as far as traditional day camps that are close by. You won't see much over the hill in Terra Linda in the way of summer camps, um, or even Nevada for that matter, until you get further up to where some of the school sites are. Um, and even that is just kind of a drop off. It's, just, it's kind of a different program. Um, since we started kind of pulling in some non-residents, that's where you'll see our camps going from zero profit to $350,000 in profit over a six or seven year span. So I look at it as an asset. Um, it keeps the prices down for our residents and helps pay for a lot of things for our camps. But it's something that we watch every year. We send out a survey and we look at our residents versus non-residents. And we get let our residents register for camp two weeks before non-residents. That type of thing. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question on uh, the vandalism issue. Uh -huh. um, I thought there was a pretty strong case that most of the events were happening during the daytime after Miller Creek was laid out. And yet now we're going to put in new lighting, indicating that, well, maybe it's happening at night too. Is that what's going on? I think they to that point in. We uh, chose to have a light draft. Uh, uh, from the, okay. Um, so we're not certain exactly when you know the damage is happening. We know that the kids are there right after school because we've talked to mothers in the area and fathers, basically stating that there are older kids you know messing around on the equipment. <coughs> as far as like the heavy damage to the playground, we're not sure if it's happening you know after that. I've had any parents report that they see kids you know jumping up and down trying to break it. You see them like you know hanging on the swings and utilizing the equipment you know that's not set for their age group. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually, I'm going to be going out there with, with Robin um, later this week to kind of just watch a little bit and see like after school what it does look like. Um, those set of lights at the playground are the only, I believe Eric can speak to it, but I think they're the only set of old lights we have where they're not as bright. Um, so just as a safety matter, it may, may also make more sense to upgrade to the new lights. Okay, and I apologize, I, I realized I just skipped the but I just, I was just curious. Well, something you talked about the condition yeah. meetings. Um, along those lines, if the lights are brighter, would that have an impact on the immediate neighbor? I don't think it'd be to that excess to where it would make a, because well, all the other street lights, you know, right in front of their house has all been changed out over the years. I'm just curious. They have a really bright blue house, I don't think they have one. Uh, any, Steven? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. First on the playground, I, I looked at that playground and in my opinion, I saw how the damage was created. It is a shear and when I looked at it, what I saw, I believe, was, uh, it, of course it was heavy use, but um, it, it, water had penetrated uh, and weaken the structure. In other words, it's a, really a design flaw more than something that, you know, a couple hundred pound kids jumping up and down could do. These are like uh, probably four, at least four by fours, maybe six by sixes. And that should be plenty and plenty of, of design capacity. But if, if a couple kids are jumping down on it and break, breaking it, I don't believe you really can say, hey, that's vandalism. It really is equipment. And um, I actually wrote uh, Shane a note saying that if we can replace that with a metal deck or some kind of structure that is not, is going to be able to withstand the abuse, I think that's fine. I mean, all playground equipment is way over designed. So the idea that kids jump around on it are going to break it you know, something's wrong, and that's what really needs fixing. Did you get the replacement for it? Is uh, No, we're expecting them early next week. I would, because I've seen those metal decks on other playgrounds. Uh, I mean, the, the playground, the structure itself is over 15 years old. 
Yeah. So I mean, it's not as robust as it was when we bought it. Right. Um, it's definitely not. It's designed for six and under, so you don't, you know, no six-year-olds cause that type of damage. Plus, there was areas where they pulled out poles, and you could tell that it was obviously done um, on purpose. Um, but to your point, when we go to get, you know, when we go to replace our playgrounds, you want something to look at. It's yeah. Okay. Sure. So the other thing is pricing, and, and we talk about this every year. And, and Jeff, actually, I don't know when you're swimming, but we've. Do you swim during the noon hours? No. You never. Okay. Six a.m. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so during the noon hours, the office crews come down and it's pretty crowded. And I would like to see some sort of uh, price differential, at least on the uh, lap swimming, um, and uh, or and maybe even have restricted hours. I'd also like to see uh, evening hours because so many of our residents work in the city and we can't possibly swim before 6 p.m. So I'd love to see uh, 6, 6 to 8 p.m., at least a couple lanes open uh, during the pool season. Um, as far as pricing goes, I also think it would be a great idea if we had, uh, just like Costco has a club, maybe we could have the Marinwood CSD club where out the residents outside the district can get resident prices if they're willing to pay a fee of some sort, I don't know, maybe a hundred bucks, uh, 50 bucks, whatever, whatever it is. But um, that will provide an incentive for uh, a consistent cash flow. Um, and uh, uh, because our camps are really pretty much at capacity, um, I, I think I think we need to look in terms of increasing pricing um, to manage the capacity to the optimum level. That's the same is true with the pool. Um, so, I, is there any way, you know, I, I've, I've talked to you about pool uh, hours and, and pricing before. Is the discussion going on now or have you already decided? It's going to be coming to the board next month. But as far as discussing the pricing. Okay. So are you open to the idea of maybe looking at a substantial change? There's already a difference in price between resident and non-resident for lap swimming even with punch. The only way you can swim during lap swim hours is a membership, which residents pay more, or a punch pass, which residents pay substantially more percentage wise. Okay, so they can't yeah, so that I think that's where where the breakdown was was a punch pass. Okay. Uh, request for permanent encroachment into district properties. Uh, yeah, I gave you a brief memo on this. Uh, I took a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Monahan, uh, who I believe are actually here this evening to speak to it as well. Uh, essentially, uh, they have a uh, staircase that comes from their property into a piece of district property out in. Lucas Valley Estates, uh, it's approximately 10 wooden steps. Uh, they are requesting a, a grant of encroachment for those steps to be allowed to stay in this property. Uh, I've included his letter, uh, and I would actually uh, just leave it up to questions and allow them an opportunity to speak on their own behalf. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been there for how many years? Uh, my understanding is since 2003. Yeah, it's stuck far off of the road. This is also a parcel that uh, uh, really doesn't serve any level of recreational purpose. It uh, is rarely traversed. It has a public utility underground easement uh, already on it, and it also has, uh, I've learned, uh, several years, even prior to this, it has a right-of-way easement on it by the county in the event that what is now the Monaghan property um, at one time, if it was to be subdivided into smaller parcels and developed, that particular parcel that we were talking about would have become a roadway. And that would mean if the roadway was in there, the stairway. Well, if the roadway was in there, the entire 
property would have uh, wouldn't exist the way it currently does. It would have been subdivided into several uh, several properties. But that's not the case. Though. That is not the case. Any, any thoughts? This is for approval, correct? Correct. Mr. and Mrs. Monaghan, yeah. Okay. Hi. <laughs> yeah, really, really just wanted to come to answer any questions that you might have. Um, the uh, this this is a little sliver of land that's about 40 feet wide and maybe about 200 feet long. Yeah. Uh, it dead ends on our property line. Um, when we bought the property, that was our understanding that that was going to be a future potential roadway. Um, we've been using it as an emergency access for. 13 years, yeah. and we built some little wooden stairs <clears throat> because it's a very steep grade that comes down through there, and it's not been a problem uh, the whole time that it's been there. Yeah. It's emergency access, we hardly ever use it. When we bought the property, we formalized an easement. Um, actually, the Herb's firm prepared the easement, and we, at the time, we thought that it included the formalization of both the uh, utilities. So we have underground right. utilities that run through that. And prior to Denny, Denny Wetzel lived there for 40 years. And she used that as an emergency access point long since we were there over the, the property that then was the Luis Ranch. So it's kind of got a little pattern of uh, foot traffic uh, for a very long time. And the only reason this came up, I think, is because the property adjacent to that changed hands. The folks that bought that property cut some bushes down. They and used the screen. He saw the stairs. And then they saw the stairs. <laughs> they, had, they had raised that to their to their realtor, you know, because we looked at the property to purchase the property. And we ultimately decided not to buy it. But we saw that, you know, that this was a condition the realtor at the time said, Oh, those are just, you know, that's like no problem. And there was no, so we were surprised when we heard the complaint. Uh, we think it's a tempest in a teapot and would prefer to see the stairs there rather than have a big brouhaha over there. You mentioned that you seldom use the stairs, but you do use the stairs. We do. Okay. But Not emergency reasons, I assume? Not oh. emergency reasons, convenience, <laughs> convenience reasons. Mm -hmm. but, but it is also an access point for the fire department to be able to have a bridge, a wooden bridge that goes across the creek. Mm -hmm. if, you know, if that were ever compromised, whether it be you know, flood or fire, there would be no way for us to evacuate. So in these recent fires in the North Bay, we put a car over on Westgate Drive, you know, with the ability that if our bridge went out, the park, because we're on the on the edge, Lucas uh, owns the property to our west, and it's all grassland. So if you ever had a fast moving fire with those winds, and if they caught the bridge on fire, we'd be we stuck. We wouldn't be able to get out. And the fire department wouldn't be able to get onto the property. Um, they've been on our property a number of times. We have some uh, a circulatory pipe that goes around, and fire hydrants, the private fire. Uh, loop that we put in in order to create, provide uh, you know, a barrier there. So that is an emergency access that works both ways. If you look at if, if you look at Earth's attachment on the easement, it, it actually says future roadway uh, on the actual easement. So it's got a uh, public utility easement, and I, I'm not sure what DE means. Is that a drainage easement? Yes. Yeah. So so when we we purchased this easement <laughs> back in 2003 from the district. Didn't really read the thing very carefully. Thought that it included the long-standing, um, what we call access easement or emergency access easement. So, really, the only thing that was a question is, you know, there's some stairs there. Uh, there were a bunch of little wooden stairs there. You know, it's pretty steep grade, and if we ever had to get out of there, we would. But, um, anyway, that's that's all I wanted the, the board to consider. Do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I, I don't, 
occasionally I go through there if I'm walking my dogs, you know, on Lucas Valley, through Lucas Valley Estates. I don't do that very often because I can walk my dogs on my own property. But that's what I use it for. And the last time I used it was during the fires, just in an overabundance of caution to park uh, a car there just, just in case, you know, because, you know, these fires are raging and they were doesn't take long for an ember to set things on fire and so um, the neighbor told me that she didn't like them because they want to put a pool in and they could see them. Any motion? Um, I, I move that we approve the permanent encroachment on the district property of ATM 164-630-01. I'll second it. No further discussion? Any further? What does this mean? What are we being asked to do? We have a, um, we have a document we need to have notarized or something? Or uh, I don't believe, and Herb can probably chime in on this better than I can, I don't believe that this is something that would be recorded, say, either against their property or against our property. I'd send them a letter on letterhead. I'd sign it off on myself. I'd make reference to... Uh, the board has approved this on this date in open session via board motion. Um, I would also, you know, probably put in some other language in there. Um, one of the things that uh, has come up is, uh, and again, this would be you know, conversations with the Monahans. Um, ideally, uh, uh, naming the district as uh, additionally insured, uh, most likely under their homeowners. Uh, policy as well as indemnify the district of any uh, liability due to those stairs. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be a pretty straightforward, simple thing. Um, I, and then I would also just kind of add a clause that the district reserves the right to uh, revoke the, the revoke the encroachment uh, permit at its discretion. I don't know why we would do that in the future, but uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think the probability of what is now their property ever being subdivided into uh, smaller parcels and multiple properties and a roadway going in there is is pretty much non-existent. Um, I don't even I don't even know if that still would be allowed if they were to sell their property and the developer could buy their property and subdivide it up and do all that. I mean, housing laws and developments change dramatically. Um, but in those essence, again, I mean, the county ultimately has a much longer pre-existing right-of-way easement on that very specific parcel to develop a road if that were to occur, at which point we wouldn't be talking about these stairs in any case. Um, but I just, uh, I think uh, those are pr probably what I would look into. I just draft up a letter that is clearly a letter that states this motion uh, approved by the board on this date. Um, with a uh, request that the district is added and provided a copy of a uh, certificate of additional insured, uh, uh, you know, up to standard amounts, which is typically of a one million aggregate, uh, and is uh, uh, you know indemnified from any uh, accident that may arise from the use of these stairs by the residents. Cool. Any questions, Steve? Uh, I may may be corrected, but my understanding of easements is they go, uh, you're, you're altering the title to that property. So when you say... We wouldn't be providing them an easement, we'd be providing them a right of encroachment. Right of encroachment, okay. So I don't know the, the, legal, de the legal distinctions. I think the use that they want to use it for is great. I don't think that's a problem, but we certainly have to protect our interest, and so make sure whatever that is that you grant them <coughs> has the right to revoke it. And I think there's no problem. Of course, You're good neighbors. Anybody else? I just want to point out that Mr. Monahan gave me credit for something I didn't really do. Uh, our office prepared the plot and legal description of the easement. Someone else wrote the. Uh, actual text <laughs> and really in reading it it's a little ambiguous uh, because it talks about allowing access and if you, to allow access it's so steep there you need stairs but it sort of says there aren't supposed to be surface things 
but there's meters and things with the utilities that the easement was written about. So uh, this is, a, I think, a good way to clarify uh, what this uh, written document says. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and again, I don't think it should be recorded as an easement per se. Uh, I would just do it as a right of encroachment uh, issued from the district to the monuments with, with the specific conditions that we've already mentioned. Sounds great. I guess on that note, I call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great holiday. Yep. You Thanks. Merry Christmas. I would also just add, I mean, they were incredibly courteous to speak with Mr. Maya. It was very courteous when he called me up. Just uh, I initially sent them a letter in the beginning of the uh, encroachment issue of the complaint. He gave me a phone call. It was just very courteous and uh, kind and understanding about the whole thing and got us to this point where we are now. So thank you for it. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Upgrade lighting at Los Colinas Mini Park to brighter than the green. Okay, oh, wait, uh, <laughs> yeah, we we have already discussed this to uh, some degree, which is why when I came back and it was being talked about, so, uh, did I just miss a whole chunk of the uh, meeting? Uh, I'm really into lighting. <laughs> Uh, again, this is, you know, I, I put this in here, obviously, uh, all I've done is some research at this point in time. Um, this is not a quote-unquote budgeted expense. This isn't a maintenance item. However, we do have money within the streetlight budget for this expense. Uh, you know, bearing in mind that money we collect from our streetlight assessment can only be spent on streetlight-related uh, expenditures, and I believe we had a surplus of just over 2000 that carried over last year into this year. Um, and it was something that was really kind of born from the commission. Hey, can we look into lighting to Shane's point that he made earlier? The, uh, it has very old 70 watt halogen style shoebox lightings. If you ever go over there at night, they really don't provide a bunch of light, um, but they are two of our recognized street lights. They're already on our maintenance contract with uh, uh, DC Electric, and they are also on the our pg e schedule. Um, it's very nominal, not even enough to even mention, but it is slightly more efficient for us to operate LED style lights, both in terms of our maintenance contract. They receive a slightly lower rate and, uh, on a monthly basis, and like a little over a dollar. Um, and in terms of energy usage, uh, they're more efficient. Uh, these would certainly be brighter. Uh, I didn't include them in here, but Miller, or Miller, just like that. DC Electric actually showed me a couple pictures of them, and they've recently done something very similar in a park in uh, Nevada. Um, so they would be $900 each, $1,800 out the door, um, purchase and install. It was some sort of adapter. Yeah, yeah, well, because it's a square peg, round hole kind of a thing. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, just to fit the curve, so that way the entire pole and everything is in every place. There would be an adapter placed onto the existing pole so that this fixture could fit onto it. Okay. Yeah, not like a power adapter or anything along those lines. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the upgrade of the lighting in the park as uh, suggested. Second. Discussion? We've had questions? Just a little question. Do you know um, how these brighter lights will affect the whole house right next door to the mini park? I don't know at this point in time that I have uh, admittedly spoken with the uh, resident about it. Well, the reason I'm asking is because I can't remember what area, I think it's Terra Linda, somewhere um, new street lights have been put up, and a lot of people on the next door website are complaining about these humongous bright lights now that they've been put on the street lights, shining into their houses and having to get, you know, double dark blinds and stuff like that. So, uh, well, I know that when the district converted all of the street lights throughout Murraywood to these LED style, they had several public hearings and things along those lines. Uh, prior to, uh, and occasionally, I get calls primarily from people who have just bought in a residence who say, hey, this bright light shines right into my kid's window. There are options in those situations to apply uh, what DC Electric calls a light shield. It costs $200 out the door. When I get that request, we usually uh, inform the resident, hey, this can be done. They can shield the light from shining directly into your window. It costs $200. This is a cost that you would have to pay for. Um, and if you'd like to do that, 
simply write a check to the district, at which time I'll authorize DC Electric to make the move. Mm -hmm. So that would be an option for them should this light decide to shine directly into their window. They're pretty low. These aren't nearly as high as standard street lights. Uh, probably two thirds the height, really. Uh, I was just kind of looking at them. I'm sure Linda's very familiar with that part. You know, those, those lights uh, don't go up super high and they wouldn't be extended any higher. They appear to be on the far side of the park from the house, too. Yeah, uh, yeah there's one, if you are staring at the park from the street, there's one that is straight back. And then there's a secondary one that's all the way to the southern edge of the park as well. And uh, there's also some trees and shrubs and bushes and things like that uh, that are in there as well. Yeah. All right. So call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Recreation and park maintenance activity reports. Any questions? I give up. Um, I don't have too much to add to the, the rec side of things, but good questions. Like I said, at the next meeting, we'll be bringing um, the rates for approval to the board. How, how was Winterfest? It was good. Really? Um, yeah, it was probably the most packed I've seen it. So it did turn out. Robin did a great job setting up and adding a bunch of new attractions. So it was, it was good. So, I was very impressed. It was a good event because I came late and everything was gone. So that's the part of a good event. You get through, you're like, I warned you before you came in the door. I said, Lily, don't totally We got our picture from Santa and some hot chocolate. So, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Um, and then as far as park, um, one thing to kind of highlight um, is the Marinland sign is back up here on Lucas Valley and Boston Bonus Road. Um, and Victor spent quite a bit of time landscaping it. I think it came out really nice. We can get all the compliments. Um, we're going to kind of, in the coming months, depending on the weather, clean up the other and the other sign and uh, kind of mimic the landscaping over there that we have on the view. Very good. Glad to have it back. So, yeah, me too. You know, I, I'm just going to throw out there too. John Hammond, I think, did a really good job on whatever he organized in the area. I was going to bring that up. I was going to bring that up. It, uh, I wasn't there, but I am familiar with the area because I ran out there a little bit. It was a disaster, and it's all gone. Wow. So you should see the stuff they found. Oh, uh, dude! I, there's homeless people living in there doing whatever they do. So I can imagine sleeping bags. Yeah. yeah. But, but it looked like thousands of people in the orange vests. Yeah. I drove by. What's going on here? Yeah. They ran out of bags. I can imagine. Uh, let's see. Well, excuse me. One quick thing for Shane. There's a large dead fallen tree on the berm. Uh, the Lucas Valley berm. Oh, 200 feet westerly of Bridgegate. Just, it's just laying there through all the. Okay. Lots like it, 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 it died and then it's rotted out and now it's fallen over. Okay. You yeah. can see it from the, the interior streets. The interior side. We'll take a look. So, your next Park and Rec Commission meeting is going to be January 23rd? Correct. Okay. Appoint incoming fire commissioners. Uh, I have a memo on this. I mean, obviously, let's handle it as two separate items, even though the memo uh, includes both. Um, so we'll just start with the fire commission. Uh, right now, there's currently one regular commissioner opportunity and one alternate commissioner opportunity for full two-year terms. Uh, two members of the community are seeking reappointment. One is Pascal Percente, uh, who is here uh, this evening. He's seeking reappointment. And another one is a gentleman named Stephen Barak who has been attending a lot of meetings and has also been attending uh, a few board meetings recently. So if you saw him, I think you'd recognize him from that. Both of their letters have uh, been included. So it's just a matter of uh, a point one and or uh, both of them and designate one who would be an alternate. And Pascal is currently He is currently, he's in here. Uh, he is currently the alternate commissioner. He is, um, 
he is seeking appointment to a regular term uh, as a regular commissioner, and uh, Stephen uh, is new on board. He is new on board. He's seeking appointment to the commission. He didn't signify between alternate or regular in his letter. And how long, Pastor, how long have you been the alternate? About a year. A year? Yeah, no, about a year, because it was vacant. He uh, inherited a vacant uh, position. Okay. Actually, uh, well, like, de facto, my one commissioner has been absent the whole time he's been. Yeah, he's actually has, has been active, because we have a commissioner who never showed, and he's off of the slate at this point in time. But the vacancy was created when Irv, resigned from the commission and moved on to the board. We had the alternate at the time became a regular and Pascal filled the alternate position. So do you think you're ready for permanence here? Do you think for a long time to realize that I could go to the North Alternate, but I got that down. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Yeah. How do we want to do this? Just make a blanket appointment um, for the fire commission based on. Make a motion. Make a motion for Pascal to take a regular commission. And right. Stephen for alternate. Okay. Okay. And Marin would alternate, correct? So yeah, we have no say over the CSA third. Correct. Yeah. But yeah. this is a Marin would person. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Did so you make such a motion? Hmm? Did someone make a motion? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I move that we um, uh, reappoint Pascal as a permanent uh, voting member of the Fire Commission and Stephen as an alternate for Marinwood. Second. Call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Welcome. Thank you. Pascal's been a nice addition. He kind of has a different um, field of excellence and experience, which the commission did not currently have. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate him being involved. And he has some good ideas on vegetation management. I'm going to work with him on. So oh, that's thank awesome. you for sticking good, around. Good addition to you. Thank you. And he gave it a good year, bro. Yeah. In Park and Rec, we have. Park and Rec, moving on to that. So there are currently three regular commissioner opportunities available for full two year terms. Five members of the community are seeking appointment. Um, three of them are current regular members seeking reappointment. One of them is the current alternate uh, seeking appointment to a regular position. And one is a, a member of the community who has uh, expressed interest in joining the commission. I've met her a couple of times. Um, and uh, that's kind of where it's at. Just to point out, as you can see, I kind of put the star in there. The current alternate position actually runs through December 2018. If you move that person or appoint that person into a regular role, um, that would open up the alternate position for a vacant term that would expire at the end of December 2018. So uh, you could choose to appoint the current alternate member to a regular member position as well as appoint uh, one of these people to fill the current alternate uh, position if you so choose. So there's two full term that were appointed. Three. 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 Oh, for two year terms. Yeah, for full two year terms. That would basically expire at the end of December of 2019. Well, out of five. Okay, I, I served as the uh, liaison of the Park and Recognition last year, and I have some thoughts that I'll, I'll share. This is just observations. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, having John Campo and John Toon on the Park and Rec Commission has been an extreme asset for this district in terms of stewardship of the parks. Um, Shane Valentine has been our, um, our lead, our chair, uh, for two years. Two years. Yeah. And um, Sivan has come back. I guess she was in, um, a commissioner before. She's attended several meetings as an alternate and has shown quite a bit of enthusiasm and um, um, interest. I do not know Kathy Joseph, but um, what I would recommend is, I would give thought to at any rate, is reappointing John Campo or Shane Valentine. Um, 
and then appointing Sivan as the, um, you know, the uh, full-time member and bringing along Kathy Joseph as an alternate. And then, parenthetically, thanking Kimberly Call, who's been a long-term member of the uh, Commission for Her Service. Can I second that? Yes, you may. Um, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Oh, aye. Aye, aye. Hold on. Hold Sorry. on. Sorry. Well, I wanted to make a comment about Savan. Savan? Yes. Um, when she was on the Park and Rec Commission before, she only attended half of the meetings. So I was just wondering what her attendance has been like recently, because I don't know if there's a good commitment, and maybe she should stay as the alternate based on her attendance. I, mean, I think her attendance has been pretty much spot on since she returned. No, um, Shane? She's been in every meeting, uh, including a meeting or two prior to being reported. Oh, she has? Right. Okay. She has. Okay. I think, Thank I you. think her, the reason for some of what you're talking about is past. I think we can count on her to be a regular contributor. I think her kids are a little older. Her kids are older. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but yeah, yeah there you go. She's got two guys. <laughs> she had a baby in the middle of her term, and she started dropping. Did we vote? I think we have a second. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And the election of board officers, president and vice president. Okay. I, I just want to uh, clarify something on that. Uh, so basically, uh, Kimberly Call is no longer serving on the, the uh, that's right. really the only change. Right. Is that true? Oh, I thought we saw her letter. Right. Um, she did. Apple. We had five. Yeah, there are, there are enough spots for everyone to apply. I'm sorry. I, there are I'm not enough. There are not enough spots for everyone who applied. Right. Um, okay. May I just uh, then make a recommendation? Uh, Kimberly is kind of. I, I think she means well, and I, I think she deserves. Uh, uh, some sort of recognition. We mentioned that. We, yeah, we did mention you, it. You do? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Election of board officers. Well, the fun part. Can we go for president first? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just again, to kind of leave this off. such a good job. I, I don't have yeah. a memo or anything on this. Uh, in accordance with your board bylaws, every December, you will uh, basically elect and appoint a president and a vice president that will take uh, effect with the January meeting. Uh, so this could be Bill's last uh, hurrah at running oh, the meeting. Darn it. Uh, to, uh, and with that, you know, you're kind of electing board officers and hoping that they will accept your nomination and then voting on it. You mean like president first and a vice president. Real, right? <laughs> You're yeah. ready. You're ready, real. Yeah. Oh yeah. So can I ask you a question? Yes. I remember I was last year and and it kind of got lost. In, but back in the day, there used to be a rotating flowchart of mm -hmm. sort of which spot, Not and then it just rotated. Yeah, and I guess I haven't seen that in a couple of years. Yeah, we don't. I have yeah. never seen it personally. Um, so maybe it doesn't. We don't necessarily have a rotating flowchart like this person is going to be the next person or. Oh. Whatever the case oh, but I'd like to back that up so it's uh, The one thing I would say, uh, and this is something that we actually encountered two years ago, um, not in any way to influence anything, but Irv and Bill's term will be ending as board members prior to the end of the calendar year to which this applies. I remember Terry Reed was the president. Uh, and didn't wind up getting reelected. I have no doubt that both Bill and Irv are already planning their reelection campaign <laughs> and are signing up for another four years. Uh, so that probably wouldn't be an issue if you were to choose one of those two. But it, it just it created a scenario where uh, we had to have a vice president come in. I believe the vice president at that point was Justin. Uh, just to do that one meeting, and then I think he actually might have been appointed, and then of course he left, and then uh, Leah was the vice president uh, at that point in time, and then got uh, the interim president tag uh, for the rest of that calendar year. So just something to kind of keep in mind, because at the end of the year it makes things a little bit tricky, but not the end of the world. 
I would definitely suggest maybe not making them president and vice president, but uh, you never know. Thank you for that explanation. I would like to make a motion <laughs> to rotate Leah Green into the position of president and my missing board member, oh, Isabella Perry, as is the vice president. <laughs> Second. Discussion? Um. <laughs> <laughs> How can they the side step, as she said? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I'm wondering about flipping, flipping the roles for the two people named, perhaps. Well, one of the reasons I mentioned it is because I know of no one that can run a more efficient meeting than you do. So, <laughs> it would be welcome. I, <laughs> I, I feel good. <laughs> Leah, just second the motion. Please. I second. You second. Oh, you second it. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yay. Yay. Good. 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 Request good. for future meeting agenda. Yeah, you know, can I just say, Bill, thank you. You've, uh, as far as yeah. what I need out of a board president, you've been very responsive. Uh, and. Uh, uh, meetings here aren't always the easiest I'm to chair and run, and I think you've done an admirable job. I'm and uh, I serve. appreciated your your, you know, your willingness to stop by on your way home from work or whatever to sign documents no or problem. whatever might be needed. Uh, so thank you. So we have a rec request for future meeting agenda items, and I think that's where you want your thing, Stephen, about the park, the trees. Uh, yeah, uh, I think. There is obviously uh, the residents on Quietwood have this idea that they can violate our borders. That's the second intrusion in six months. The first was the uh, uh, the debt that someone uh, uh, built, and uh, I notified them right uh, the CSD right away, and it was took three weeks to get them out. And then we had this thing uh, two doors up. So uh, that. I, I don't know if that's an agenda item, but uh, I'm pretty pissed that we're not we're not uh, uh, protecting our borders, and I don't think it is up to the CSD director to determine uh, uh, the state of mind of the resident when when they do something that is so clearly wrong to our uh, to our parks. I would like to see. Um, a policy created yeah. uh, that you know procedures that 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 need to be followed if such incursions occur. I'd also like to see um, a written policy, and I've asked for this before, uh, a management policy for uh, they're calling it open space, but it's I call it the nature trail. But I would like to see at least a few areas in our open space protected and um, managed in a way to maximize the beauty and, and uh, the natural environment. Um, I don't think that's asking a lot. Um, maybe that would be someone that reports to Shane. Um, but uh, so these, these are, I'm very passionate about the parks. The other thing is, um, there's been talk about playground equipment. I would love to see uh, some upgraded uh, natural playground equipment in our parks for our children and for adults to enjoy spending time with their children. Um, that would be different than the, the off-the-shelf stuff that we have now. Some, something more sculptural and, and beautiful that says Marinwood. A sense of place. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll do this first. I, I would request that we put an item on the agenda for next meeting that deals with, uh, I guess I'll call it illegal encroachments. Uh, I don't know if the, if the tree cutting is counted as that, but there's at least two major encroachments into our property. Uh, over on the one behind Etta Court, another off of Las Guinness Avenue, right by Miller Creek, the creek, not the road. Uh, the, and I, 
Stephen was asking about a policy. Well, we, ha we don't have a policy. We have an ordinance. Yeah. And uh, it talks about a lot of these things. But I think possibly between the, the, we ought to request that Parks and Rec looks at that before we discuss it next meeting. Uh, I know for the, this, the lady on uh, Quietwood, it says we have all kinds of uh, leverage here. And we can, we can fine her $50 for cutting those trees down. Because it's right here, black and white. Per tree? No, just $50. Uh, well, if you're using if you're using the county, I mean, they they threw the felony charges at, at the uh, the violation of Dennis uh, that, that did the same thing. So I I'm not I'm not suggesting that we go there, but I'm suggesting that there is a penalty sufficient to draw to the attention uh, of other residents that if you do this, you're going to uh, have to be held accountable. Linda, you had. Well, first, I want to volunteer to pass out the ordinance to all the people lining Quietwood. Well, it's on That's, the website. That's how I got it. I will volunteer. Anyways, um, the only thing that I would like to add to future boarding me, future board meeting agenda items is a written policy about communications responses from the district manager in a timely fashion. Else? Recognitions and board member items of interest. I, I want to just bring up a couple of things. The Lions Club and their volunteers Sunday morning was a phenomenal job. Cam was out there. I talked to him for a while and hustled to try to get extra bags for them. But uh, they did one hell of a cleanup. They, they mentioned that there were a lot of MES students out there volunteering. And then uh, Les and Patty Mize and Roy Nisha with the Bear House and uh, Mickey Mouse Christmas. Now, I'd love to have something written up for them. Uh, this is going to be their last year. Last year. Both of them, yeah. And it's just been phenomenal. The kid, My kids grew up with them. Yeah. And it's, it's special and it's really sad to see. It's the third yeah. major Christmas time show we've lost in yeah. my time. Mm -hmm. Oh, when you say Mishnah's 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 Mishnah's
Yeah. Uh, and present it to her in a frame, um, invite her to the January meeting or whatever the case may be. Anything else? Then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.